where Jim read us in Psalms, the 45th Psalm. I had an idea I wanted to try to get across this evening. And uh, I got to admit, I don't know if it's going to work or not. Uh, sometimes you hit the bell and sometimes you miss it. I want to try to talk about an issue without talking about the issue. So, can I be more evasive than that? Let's start with the lesson outline, and let's start with the lesson title. I take the title from verse 4 of Psalms 45. Um, Jim made some comment when I gave him the reading. He's something about, sounds like this guy is really looking forward to getting married. And I said, well, it depends on who you are and depends on who you're marrying. I think my belief would be this psalm being one of a, a, a song of love. It's, I had a another Bible that in the notes said this was a, a song of ascension for a, for a groom in a wedding. So you can see that this is a pretty significant groom. He's a prince or a king, I'm not sure which. Uh, he is in splendor and grandeur, and he's getting married. And it's, it's talking about sort of the, the attributes of this, uh, of this uh, groom um, he's fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured on his lips. God has blessed thee forever. He's got a sword girded on. He's mighty in his splendor and majesty. He's going to, uh, in his majesty, he's going to ride on victoriously. Now, that's what every, that's what every prospective husband wants to hear. This is going to, this is going to work out for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let thy right hand teach thee awesome things. We don't run those three together very often, do we? This idea, I mean, you, you look at the, the figure here, you look at the character and the character traits that we see presented here, and you're thinking, man, this guy is like, you know, if you ever watch the Disney movies, there's Prince Ali, and he comes marching in, you know, and he got the elephants, and they got the dancers, and, the, and all the splendor and majesty, and that's what's going on here. But He's going to ride majestically and victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness or humility and righteousness. Uh, Chuck is my clicker, so i got to say beep or something like that so that he can advance the slides for me. Beep. Usually just a space bar will do it. Maybe not. Forward arrow. This is going to be a short lesson. If all I get is my cover slide. So let's look at those three words real quick. While Chuck figures this out. Um, I, I think we know what truth is. Just on time. Firmness. Sureness. Stability and reliability. I took this from the Hebrew of these words. I'm not going to give you all of the, uh, uh, the background structure of, of why these words translate into these words in our Bibles, but you can take this word truth and see, and see that it's truth in the way that truth is a, is a solid rock. It's there, it's firm, it's sure, it's stable, it's reliable. That's the connotation of this kind of truth that we're talking about here. Be Humility is just, it's just meekness. There's really no other uh, phrasing that this was translated into in the Hebrew that I saw. And then finally, this idea of justice, being righteous or fair. And, and implied in this one, I think, where we get this figure of, of what we call Lady Justice, she's often presented with this pair of scales in her hands because justice is one where uh, it, it all measures out, it all balances. It all bounces out in the end. And so it's a, a matter of fairness for, for weights and measures. If you're buying so many hector or, or, or whatever it is of grain or something, it's that uh, the transaction is fair. It's, it's, uh, it, it's one we can count on. That's, that's how these phrases are used. And think about, again, truth being stable and sure and steadfast and reliable and stable. But then the idea of humility and meekness as well. If you turn over to Jeremiah, we can get the next slide too while we're turning. 
Jeremiah chapter 13. It's the illustration that many of us probably remember. The prophet was told to have buried a, a strap or some kind of waistband or cable or something. He, he was told to bury this, this belt maybe. It um, might be leather, it might be made of cloth, I don't know what it is, but he, he, took a, he took a belt or a waistband and went to the Euphrates and dug. So he's in soft, squishy, muddy dirt if he's digging by the river. And he buries this waistband and hid it. And the waistband is totally ruined. It is, it is worthless. Jeremiah 13, beginning verse 10, this wicked people who refuse to listen to my words, who walk in the stubbornness of their hearts and have gone after other gods to serve them and to bow down to them. Let them just be like that waistband, which is totally worthless. For the waistband clings to the waist of a man, so I made the whole household of, of Israel and the whole household of Judah cling to me, declares the Lord, that they might be, for me, a people of renown, for praise and for glory. But... They did not listen. This, this pride, this uh, arrogance, this self-will that goes between ourselves and God renders us totally worthless. Totally worthless. That is the effect of pride on, on truth. Romans chapter 2 in verses 7 and 8, talk about this incompatibility. Romans 2, verses 7 and 8. Uh, well, verse 5, because of the stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you're storing up for yourselves wrath uh, in the day of wrath and, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Who will render to every man according to his deeds? Verse 7, to those who by perseverance and doing good Seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But to those who are selflessly ambitious, or selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of the man who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. It's incompatible. This, this selfish ambition, this pride, putting ourselves in front of, in front of, uh, seeking the will of God. Um, verse, says, verse 8 says, they do not obey the truth. Next slide. There's an article I'm borrowing some of these quotations from. I'll give uh, credit there. The fellow's name's James Clear. I'm not really familiar with a lot of his works, but I read a few, a few things that he had put out, and this was an article that he entitled, Why Facts Don't Change Our Minds. And from this, I like the quote here of the economist, um, uh, J.K. Galbraith. And since I don't have the screen, I gotta turn around and read it to you. He says, faced with a choice between changing one's mind and proving there's no need to do so, almost everyone gets busy with the proof. And I thought about that in terms of these verses. And I think there's, I think there's great relevance to this in that when we are challenging ourselves and our convictions and what we hold to be true our first inclination is for our pride to get in the way and to say I don't need to change the way I think about things because I've already got this all worked out I don't need to recognize that maybe it's my own arrogance that is preventing me from seeing what it would be obvious to other people. So when confronted with this choice to make about whether to update my perspective of how things are true and the, the facts that are before me, my first go-to is I don't have to change anything. I'm pretty happy where I am. And there's reasons why this is true, and we'll get into some of that. Next slide, please. You know, if you look over at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, I think there's an example of this here. 
that might help illustrate the point. 1 Corinthians 8, chapter 8, and verse um, 7 says, however, this is talking about um, the thing sacrificed to idols. However, not all men have this knowledge that, that a thing sacrificed to, to an altar is nothing. But some being accustomed to the idol until now eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled. Now, we've studied 1 Corinthians 8 quite a bit in terms of liberties and in terms of uh, how we don't judge another man's liberties, but I want to think about it in terms of how, what it teaches us about truth. And for this person, uh, this letter says, for this person, not all men have this knowledge. Now, it, it, just, it, it just acknowledged in prior reading that it's because of their own personal practice and because of their heritage and because of their recollection of things and how they've always been, those things sacrificed to idol, that meat sacrificed to idol, is still somehow got some kind of uh, blemish or taint to it. I, I, can't, I can't eat that. I don't want to participate in that sacrifice to an idol. But, the, but, but focus on the way this is worded. Not all men have this knowledge. Now, it would not be a challenge to their conscience unless they had been taught at some point that the things sacrificed to idols are nothing. I mean, had they never heard that, they would have been going along just like before and go, well, let's see, I used to be an idolater, and we'd go down to the temple and we'd offer this meat and we would partake of it as, as part of a religious ceremony. And we would eat those things. And if I had never heard in any time as a Christian going forward, oh, I, no one's ever talked to me about that. How would, how would that then create a, 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 a conflict between my conscience and what I think I know? So this person, they have the knowledge, but it's, it's contextual truth. And all I mean by that is to this person, it's just as real as rain. Nothing's changed in their mind regarding their attitude toward things sacrificed to an idol. It's not that they haven't been taught that there's another way to look at it. It's that in their mind, there is no other way to look at it. And it's just as if nothing's changed. And so they don't have the knowledge. Some men don't have the knowledge. I just find that interesting. It doesn't say we weren't able to convince them. Now remember, when we're talking about personal liberties, nowhere in any of the, the context of 1 Corinthians are we to read into or infer that once the person who has a weak conscience finally comes around to seeing it my way, then we can be in fellowship with one another. In fact, we know that's not the context because the context is don't judge the conscience of another person when it's a matter of a choice. And this individual chooses to think that that sacrifice has still gone to a foreign God. But the scripture says they don't have knowledge of it. Because to them, it's still a fact. It's just as real as can be. And that's an important part to recognize in this, is that truth can become ingrained. It's not a universal truth that the things sacrificed to idols are nothing. Because to those who are steeped in it, those who were raised in it, those who practiced it, it doesn't just go away because they have the knowledge of the truth revealed to them. It says they don't even have the knowledge. Now, again, you know from what it says in verse 1, concerning the things sacrificed to idols, we know that all, excuse me, we know that we all have knowledge. Now remember, those folks in verse 7, they've been taught. But it didn't change their conviction. Verse 1 says, you know we all have knowledge. Okay, we're the ones that get it, right? 
knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. So what does that mean? I don't, I don't have to hold and wait till this other person changes their mind. I can be in fellowship with that person when they have a different contextual truth. It's truth to them. And, and, and that's okay. That's okay in this context. That's okay. Because I don't have a hard and fast mandate from God that I have to change my perspective on things that were sacrificed to foreign gods. So what happens is we have people that have different convictions, different, different uh, conclusions on a matter. We have those who just see things from a different perspective because of how they grew up, what their parents taught them, what they've learned from others. Um, next slide, please. I don't know if Chuck can't hear me or can't get it to slide. Let's be turning to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 says uh, in verse 1, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So why is it, why is it that, that, that Paul admonishes Timothy and talks about this idea of truth being of the group? Because what Paul is saying is the things that I have taught you, or the things that I have, you've heard me in the presence of many witnesses, having been entrusted to the faithful man, those are the things I want you to continue to teach others. And so that, there is a sense of community there. There is a sense of we talk the same talk and we walk the same walk. I think maybe you've gone forward a couple slides. See if you can go back. No, let's go forward. There we go. Let's stop here. Back or forward? Forward. Okay. So, what, what Paul is saying is obviously true, is that the things that he taught were, were of God. But so was the revelation that the things that are offered to idols are nothing. That came from God too. That's not a man's doctrine. That's a truth. There is no other gods. There are no gods before God. They don't exist. They're in the imagination of men. That's, that's an absolute truth. And so the fact that you may partake of the meat sacrificed to idols because those idols are absolutely nothing is just as true and it's just as much from God as other things that are taught. And you're beginning to say, now you're really beginning to confuse me with this lesson now. Right? The things that, that Paul admonished were going to be taught to other people. So there's this sense of, um, the source was God, but it's still a generational knowledge. It's one that should be passed forward. Let's get the next slide, please. This is another quote. This is Steven Pinker who uh, I think he's a psychologist at Harvard. He kind of looks like a psychologist at Harvard, doesn't he? He says, people are, uh, are embraced or condemned according to their beliefs. So one function of the mind may be to hold beliefs that bring the believer, the holder, the one who has these ideas, the greatest number of allies, protectors, or disciples, rather than beliefs that are most likely to be true. And I would agree with that statement. I think it's, it's not a biblical statement. It's a statement of human nature. It's a statement of the way we are kind of wired to work in society. Is that we, wanna, we want to fit in with what's believed in, in popular culture and believed in proper society to be that which is righteous and good. We want to be in that group. We want to be part of that 
uh, that, that perspective on how things are. It's not only God that judges us for our words. It's, it's part of the culture we live in. And so our tendency could very well be that we're looking for where's the least pain in what we believe. Who's going to give us a harder time? Those who are within our circle or people we don't know. It creates a tendency in all human beings to say, I'm going to go along with my people because it's easier than pushing against my people. But maybe, maybe the other side is right. It's just a human nature. It's just a tendency, and it's one we need to be aware of. Uh, next slide, please. And, you know, the Pharisees give a great example of this, an absolutely picture-perfect example of this of this mentality. In Matthew 22, they were looking to catch Jesus as was their practice in his own words, catch him, trip him up with his own speech, his own ideas. Pharisees went and counseled together, Matthew 2, 15, about how they might trap him and what he said. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians these aren't Jesus' disciples. This is the Pharisees' disciples. And they're saying, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth and defer to no one. You are not partial to any. And then they lay their question on them. You know? The Pharisees knew the power of this tribalism, this tribal thinking. And, and these disciples explained it so eloquently and they used it to, to uh, falsely flatter Jesus by saying, hey, Jesus, you are, you, are the, you are the teacher. You are the rabbi. That doesn't even care that the Pharisees disagree with you. That makes us really like you. That makes us drawn to you. Now, they're lying through their teeth. But what they're saying is an illustration of this idea that we can be persuaded by who it is that has an idea or who it is that has an idea that's in conflict with others that we don't like. And we'd be gravitating to that because we've got our people and, and these falsely, these men were falsely, were saying, man, we really, we really admire that in you, Jesus, because you just speak the truth of God no matter whose feelings get hurt about it. Now, the, what, you see, the irony, of course, is that they were right, but they were using it to shame Jesus. And that illustrates the point. We use our connectivity with those that we are in agreement with, or we can, I, say, I should say, we can potentially use that connectivity and that influence to shame others into going along with us rather than dealing with the substance of what it is that's being taught. 1 John chapter 1 also illustrates, I think, some of this idea. And it's just something, it's just something to know, especially when we're faced with a choice. 1 John chapter 1 we understand that the word here is, is the manifestation of God in human form, taking the form of a man, but also personifying the word, the spoken word, the, the, the mind of God through what he taught. And that the Father was manifested to us in verse 3, and it was proclaimed. And with that proclamation... We found, too, that Christ would have fellowship with us in verse 3, and indeed our fellowships with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And all these things we write that our joy may be complete. This is good. This, this idea of fellowship is this idea of having that connection, having that mental connection with other people who believe what we believe. And it's, it's a positive thing. Verse 6 says, if we say that we have fellowship with him 
And yet we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's the conclusion of the matter regarding that fellowship. As long as our fellowship was, is with Christ and with God, then our fellowship is one that's going to be um, leading us in light, for, for, for a walk in light. But we do, next slide, we do get in this problem of what happens as we seek truth, humility, and righteousness. All at the same time, what happens when it comes to conflict with our fellowship? What do we make of that dilemma? Next slide, please. We're faced with a fork in the road as a figure of speech. When we, when do we defend ourselves? And when do we disregard those who don't like our conviction or for those who assign a belief to me that I don't even hold for myself? In other words, someone has made an accusation that, um, well, Walker believes X. And I say, I don't believe that to be true. Well, it's been, it's been taught at 25th Street. And it's been taught from the pulpit at 25th Street. And so, I think Walker's in on it. And therefore, Walker believes this. And it's been made in a, a form to bring question to my belief or my conviction. Or maybe it's been to put my faith in a poor light among those whom that accusation has been made. And I'm not going into the accusation because most of you don't even know what it is. Some of you do. But I want you to get the point of the lesson. The point of this lesson is not to debate that accusation. It's what happens when there has been a claim that I am a believer in X doctrine, and X doctrine is not accepted in the fellowship. So what are we going to do? What am I going to do? With that fork in the road, next. First of all, calm down. It's not the end of the world. There may be some principles we can learn, but the first thing is don't go off half-baked. Don't get all worked up. And look and see if there's some positive principles, principles that we can use to diffuse this dilemma. Next slide, please. So what am I going to do? Next slide. Perhaps we need to study it. Maybe there's something here we need to look at. I think we skipped one, but that's all right. <clears throat> Go forward one, please. Maybe I skipped one. That could be very possible. So maybe we need to dig into this and really start to try to uncover something here. But perhaps in doing so, all we're doing is making something out of nothing. You know, there's a chance that when we took our position on X doctrine, that we had some conversation about. It. Maybe there has been some discussion at the time. But to, to say, well, we've been accused of being now in some form of heresy because of the position that was taken. And I would argue that we never took the position but we have studied a topic, okay? So if I'm going to bring this topic up and say, well, we need, to, we need to hash this through, we need to look at it, all I might end up doing is just reinforcing the falsehood by dwelling on it and studying it through 
to conclude, well, you know, huh, there might be something to that after all. Maybe I, I start to have people now want to change their convictions because I've been accused of believing in it. And, well, you know, he's an elder here and he studies his Bible too and maybe he's on to something. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to use, I don't want to create or further the dilemma or the fork in the road when you have those who we would say we want to be in fellowship with who've made an accusation with, well, I got to defend that. Well, maybe I don't. You know, in humility, maybe I don't. Maybe all I end up doing is just reinforcing this falsehood do we, do we accept this truth now as conviction uh, that we formerly dismissed because of who it is that questions our convictions? Next slide. I would offer that this morning we had a great example of what to do other, other than that and that we dealt with challenging us to reach deeper into our relationship with God. This accusation, I will tell you, from what I know of the accusation, is unfounded. I believe it's a false accusation. I don't believe I ever took this position or that I ever encouraged others to take this position. But I'd rather spend time on the kind of lesson we had this morning. Looking at how to, to draw closer to God in a true, meaningful, personal relationship. Looking at ways to, to encourage one another and grow in love and compassion towards one another. I just see so many things that are so much more important for us when we have a limited amount of time and a limited amount of talent to try to work out all of the doctrines that may be flying over our heads. Next slide, please. You know, we say this. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. And... I believe that. I would certainly encourage you if you want to challenge anything scripturally that I've said tonight. I think that offer always stands. And if I am seeking truth, humility, and righteousness, I'm open to that conversation 100% of the time. You know, I think it's interesting it, that, that this prince, this getting married, this prince back in, in, in Psalms, was, was defending truth that was foundational and stable and solid like a rock. But then also that word righteousness in there, meaning what's fair and good. You know, there are truths that just don't need to be said sometimes because they're not good. They're not righteous. Many of you know Mother Mary, and Mother Mary's not here to defend herself. But my mother will say things that they may be true. <laughs> they're not righteous. They're not, they're not helpful. They're not balanced in what's said. There may be things that I see and I think they're true, and I'm really in certain situations, doing you a favor by keeping my beliefs to myself. If you are in error, if you are in contrary to the scriptures and foundational matters that I can just open the, the page and show you what it says without having to convince you that's what it says, then I'm doing you no favor by keeping my silence. But I think that I think that Prince, in all of his glory and all his majesty and all his humility, and that's the hard part to remember, that word humility was wedged between those two ideas of truth and righteousness. 
And if you had one of those word puzzles where you say, throw out the one that doesn't fit, we throw meekness out. Because we, we say, well, truth is, is truth. It's like a rock. And, and, and righteousness is always right. And those are both true statements. But they don't work in exclusion of humility. What if I'm wrong? What if I'm just flat out wrong? Maybe I didn't hear what they said, the accusation or the, or the counter belief or whatever it is. Maybe I just didn't get a full account of how they presented why they were concerned about what I believe. Okay? I, I could be potentially more interested in keeping a good name with the wrong circles so that I'm not belittled or that my name is not drugged through the mud, so to speak. Maybe that's my interest. Maybe that's why I want to turn to this accusation and try to confront it, face it. Face it. And it's maybe just because I'm not really so much worried about my influence. Maybe it's just my pride getting in the way. Maybe I don't have the humility. I should. Maybe... God put that false accusation out there to humble me. Is that a possibility? I think it is. I believe it. That God could use someone else's false accusation of my character in order to humble me. Maybe I don't have a problem in that particular area. But maybe the test is, how's Walker going to deal with that? It's a false accusation. He could come out guns a-blazing, like we say, or to the parable or the, or the song. Those swords, sheen would come out and be like, charge, because he's going to defend the truth. And maybe, because of my influence, because of the heart of other people that I don't know, I mean, I, I can hear your words, but I can't judge your heart. With your fruit, I can know you. But we can also, as human beings, infer and put motive to things that were said where that motive we inferred didn't match up with why they said it. So there's times to know more. And there's times to let it go. How is this going to affect my overall influence here? in Columbus, if there are people talking and saying, yeah, but one of their elders is, believes a false doctrine and should be booted out of the, of the fellowship of the Church of Christ. I don't know I have an answer every time. But what I'm trying to say with this lesson is, leave the door open. Leave the door open for possible solutions that may not be our first reaction, which is to charge in and start swinging the sword. Do I have another slide or is this it? I do. Second Timothy 2.10. Paul says to Timothy, For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. If I'm reading this correct and correctly, Paul is saying, I'm going to take a hit. I'm going to be wronged. It's not doing me any good for someone to drag me through the proverbial mud. But Paul says, sometimes I'm going to take a hit for the sake of the chosen, the elect. My reaction or my overreaction or my inaction may have greater consequences than the initial accusation. So what do I do with that? 
Now, I'm supposed to come down to the end of the lesson and tell you how to react, right? When I get to the end of the lesson, so, so what do I do? Truth, humility, and justice. It's a balancing act. It's a balancing act. And I think because of that balancing act, my first priority is not what's the impact on me. My first priority is what is the impact on others. Who is looking for me to deal with this like some kind of warrior? And who's looking for me to find balance in the way that I might respond to something like this? The Christian life expects us to use the intellect that God gave to each one of us. And I'll even go so far as to say he gifted some of us more than others with that. And that's okay too. Because you're only accountable for what you can do. And if you see any kind of a lesson here, I, I am thankful that you were able to extract something from these ramblings this evening. But I think this is something that we spend way too much energy on. And we don't have to if we can find prudent, balanced ways to handle our first reaction to an accusation and deal with that biblically so that it's not about me, it's about others. I think most of the time we can come to a resolution. And we may not always come to a resolution, not in this life, but I'm going to keep my fellowship with Christ and I'm going to keep my humility while I do that. If you have any need this evening that we can help you address, if there's something we can do together as a body of Christ, as, as God's people, where we can show deference to one another, where we can show compassion and show mercy and use righteous justice and use truth and a measure of self-debasement, humility, I think we can get through it. I'm sure we can. If you have any need, let us know as we stand and sing.